where everything is big, these are the biggest. Weighing in at 160 tonnes, they're able to carry more than 200 tonnes of ore. Moving these trucks across 360 kilometres of rough semi-desert country, through creek beds and over rough station roads, is an adventure most people would not want to try. It's a long, slow journey. Despite the 2,000 horsepower diesel locomotive engines, the haul packs crawl along at a maximum speed of 20 kilometres an hour, and that's on good roads. The trucks were originally bought by the Hammersley Iron Company for its Tom Price mine site. But the company soon found the giants were incompatible with the rest of the site's equipment. At the same time, the Mount Newman Company was looking to increase its fleet and a deal was made. With a price tag of almost $2 million apiece, the decision by Newman to risk its new acquisitions on a rough cross-country haul could seem strange. But according to the trek organiser, Terry McNamara, there were some advantages. We felt it would be a, a time-saving exercise in getting the trucks to go to work cutting waste and uh, Certainly from mine and my offsiders point of view that coordinated this trip, we thought it would be uh, very interesting to do and uh, something different for Mount Newman. I think it was slightly dearer, perhaps five or $6,000 to drive the trucks, but uh, in the time gain bringing them from Tom Price to Newman, I think uh, probably there will be some monetary gain there, but at this stage we can't work it out. We contacted the manufacturer and uh, we had a manufacturer's representative travelling with us on this journey and. Uh, he assured us they were an off-road vehicle and uh, many of our experienced people in the maintenance of these trucks assured us that uh, they could travel but certainly uh, there were some undertones in my mind that damage could have been sustained and uh, we'll out some time for uh, break downs hopefully of a minor nature. But there were no problems at all. The five trucks and their support vehicles completed the journey in just three days, two shorter than expected and without so much as a flat tyre. And from the company point of view, that must have been a relief. You could buy a small sedan car for the price of just one of the tyres on these trucks. Despite the ordeal of the cross-country trek, the Mount Newman Mining Company had little difficulty in getting its workers to take part. More than 60 of the company's haul pack drivers volunteered. The five who went on the trek won the job by having their names pulled out of a hat. <laughs> and despite three days of heat, flies and red dust, it was difficult to find any complaints at all. We only had a couple of bad patches out of that blue dust this morning, wasn't it? Bloody held us up a bit, that was all. Slowed us down a bit, but we got through it. Lost a bit of traction, but... Uh, well, if the roads had been in grades a bit better, we might have... <laughs> Right, right. That wasn't too bad. Another one. A bit more scenery. Let's put it that way. It's just one continuous run, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What? See, the mine, you, the mine, you're in one area all the time. You, you get a bit more bloody scope with coming in the bush for a couple of days. Let's face it. I like that. I like that. Do it again. I'll do it again. It's the often. I'll do it again. It's better. Yeah. 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 During their journey, the trucks crossed through pastoral stations, open ranges, and even a national park. At times, graders had to be used to make tracks for the convoy. Despite the fact that it took only a few days to complete the trek, the preparations stretched over some weeks. There was a great deal of preparation for the fact that we had to get two very big machines out there and uh, we had to comply with very stringent environmental conditions, uh, which everyone in the company agreed with, but. Uh, 
you know, meant uh, destroying nothing virtually and uh, at the same time making sure you had access for 24 foot wide vehicles to traverse the uh, terrain. Well, from an environmental point of view, was there a great amount of difficulty uh, for you in planning it? Well, we had this in the back of our mind and obviously we had to stress to our, uh, our foreman and our plant people out there just how important the uh, environmental aspect was, both from the station owner's point of view and uh, from the National Park's point of view. And I think they handled it magnificently. It was uh, where the truck can run, touch nothing, and you've seen that. Your last couple of days looking at the route, uh, that's exactly what we did. Where they could run, they ran on the uh, normal terrain. Obviously the, the hardest part and the most frustrating part from our point of view was the acquisition of permits from uh, numerous bodies and uh, just thinking of all the log logistics, uh, breakdowns as we discussed earlier, what alternatives, what could happen and uh, taking the minimum gear and the minimum people to make it an economical exercise. What sort of difficulties did you, difficulties did you in fact run into during the exercise? Uh, very negligible, a set of brushes for a traction motor, a few inevitable flat tyres on the support vehicles, none on the hall packs themselves, fortunately. Uh, a few logistics problems with accommodation and uh, camping out, this sort of thing, but uh, nothing of a major nature where complaints would be registered. Very smooth. <laughs> Near the end of the trek, the trucks and their support vehicles moved out of the scrub and under police escort into the mine site. Their arrival after three days and 360 kilometres was something of a triumph. At times, the trucks had crossed stretches of ground that would have perhaps been a challenge to a four-wheel drive vehicle. The five giant haul packs brought the Mount Newman fleet of 200 tonners to 22, a considerable number when you realise there are only 35 of these trucks in the world. But they arrived unscathed, and within 48 hours, the first of them was hard at work on the mine face. For the company, it was a major achievement. The trucks were in service far earlier than was otherwise possible. And for those who took part, it was an adventure to be talked about for months to come. All radio units, attention all radio units. Commencing immediately, there will be a radio silence during blasting operations that will last until the blasting foreman gives the all clear. During this period, all units not directly connected with the blast will remain silent. It's appropriate that one of Australia's most exciting export industries begins and ends in a spectacular fashion. The Australian iron ore story starts with a massive explosion in the desert-like country of the Pilbara in the far northwest. And it ends with a giant ore carrier transporting the valuable export throughout the world.
Everything about the industry is big. From the explosion to the machinery that clears the loosened ore, from the trains to the ships that act out the final scene, the entire operation is of a size that until it is seen is almost impossible to comprehend. From the mine face, the ore is carted in haul packs for crushing and then stacking over two concrete tunnels. As the trains move through the tunnels, the ore pours into them at an average rate of 4,000 tonnes an hour. operation completed, Australia's $800 million a year export begins the 400 kilometre journey. the larger Pilbara operators are among the most modern in the world. They carry a greater tonnage than the entire government network in Western Australia. And the whole operation is controlled from one central control room. So again, a slight derailment. Can you give us uh, a couple of details? Not as yet, though, we stopped at 10.05. Let's get busy inside number two at the moment, so uh, that's what I can tell you. Right, so it's actually in the tunnel where it's derailed. The final stage of the iron ore story happens on the Pilbara coast. The train unloading process is as basic and quick as the loading at the mine site. Here at Nelson Point in Port Hedland, the trains of the Mount Newman Mining Company are moved through a marshalling yard with more than 40 kilometres of rail line before being emptied of their cargo. To be unloaded, the ore cars are simply picked up three at a time and turned upside down. After unloading, the ore moves along a maze of conveyor belts through a series of crushers and screeners to emerge in the various grades and sizes ready for export.
with a massive 1,000 ton machine, capable of discharging up to 6,000 tons of ore an hour. With more than one reclaimer working, the ore can pour into the holds of a ship at a rate of more than 8,000 tonnes an hour. With the sailing of the ore carrier, the Australian iron ore story comes to an end. But after processing and manufacturing in countries like Japan, the Netherlands, Germany and Belgium, much of one of Australia's greatest exports returns in the form of motor vehicles, washing machines and other metal imports. The iron ore story of Australia's far northwest has been a story of massive development and startling success. Little more than 10 years old, it has catapulted the Pilbara from a sparsely populated semi-desert to one of Australia's biggest industrial regions. And it has moved Western Australia above the rather unflattering description of a former Australian Prime Minister as just a place of sun, sand, flies and sore eyes. an hour from now. It's a quarter past seven. The metropolitan forecast for today, we're expecting showers increasing during the day with a maximum of around 15 degrees. And just looking further up along the coast today in the Pilbara, most centres expecting maximums. Of it's early morning. Degrees. Colin Best has finished breakfast and is ready to start the last leg of his long trip from Perth. Whaleback begins the day filling the charge holes with the explosive mixture. Later on, 300,000 tonnes of ore will be shattered from the bench face. Peter Gooch has guided many ships to the wharf at Port Hedland. Port Hedland Harbour, Six hours from now, a Japanese ore ship will be loading iron ore. Shortly before eight o'clock, Scylla Stack takes her daughter to school in Karatha. Well, we came up here nearly a year ago now, when my husband was appointed Shire Engineer. We were very pleased to come here because 
It's one of the fastest growing shires in the state and it's quite an exciting job for him to have. It's a very new place, of course, and uh, at the moment particularly, uh, there is a feeling that it's a very rapidly developing place. The day starts early for those who live in the northwest, and it's not just the people who are on the move. There are over 100,000 cattle in the Pilbara. From time to time, the pastoralist musters his herd to find out how many stock he has, to weigh them, to send some to market, and to tag the new calves. These cattle are on Malina Station. Not far from the homestead is the spot where an early settler, Jimmy Withnall, picked up a stone to throw at a crow and found the rock was a lump of gold. This opened up the Pilbara goldfields and 200 kilometers east of here, gold was mined at Marble Bar. Marble Bar is known by most people for its high temperatures and the bar of banded jasper. Northwest tidal creeks and seas are unsuitable for swimming, but fishing is popular and rewarding. It's coming up to seven minutes past eleven o'clock, six NEW FM stereo. And Newman's weather today is pretty cloudy outside. Little or no rain expected with light winds. Like all the staff at Radio 6 NEW, Wayne Perkins is a volunteer. 20, 20 degrees. The whole operation of the radio station is run by enthusiastic amateurs who find it an interesting and worthwhile hobby. Normally, Wayne works at the Mount Newman mine as a haul pack driver. charges have been laid and connected. When a shelf is being blasted, nothing is left to chance. All work stops in that section of the mine and the workers are taken off to lunch. Bowlers, that's my area all clear and I'm clearing out now. The blasting manager makes a personal check of all the levels. When he's satisfied they're clear, the charges can be detonated. Uh, hook her up. Firing in 30 seconds. Twenty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, fire.
this mine, some 280,000 tons of material are shifted each day, seven days a week, 363 days a year. That's a lot of iron ore. crushed at the mine and then taken to the coast by train. Roger, your first one, 10 kilometres an hour passing track Walla. 35. Traffic controllers at Port Headland monitor all the trains for their whole journey. 7, 8, Headland. Go ahead, Sardinia. Uh, right, uh, do a bit of stop at 65 if we have any west side there or one bit of north side to Alma. It'll take about 10 hours non-stop to cover the longest privately owned railway in Australia. After unloading and more crushing, the ore is stockpiled to await the ore ship. 